Okay, I just want to welcome everybody. It's about eight o'clock. Um, we'd like to get started with our program and welcome everyone to our second uh, sports medicine grand rounds. Um, we have a huge amount of interest in this topic and we're really excited to have you all today. Someday I hope I can see you all again, um, but uh, for now this is a great way to connect with all of you in our community. Uh, today's topic is going to be focusing on uh, COVID-19 return to athletics and uh, sports cardiology. My name is Diana Toto. I'm the Director of Sports Medicine and Business Development um, for St. Barnabas Medical Center and uh, RWJ Barnabas Health. I also oversee the Morahan Health Assessment Center for athletes. Um, we've been doing programs such as this since 2010. We've educated over 12,000 people in our efforts and um, we have over 30 school contracts. I think um, that's all the more reason why it's so important during a pandemic uh, to stay very connected with all of you, um, our providers and our clinicians on the front line uh, that are taking care of everyone during this really, really challenging time. So um, I will tell you that our panelists today, uh, you could not be in better hands. They have been working tirelessly around the clock um, with our athletes. Uh, I'm privileged to learn from them. I'm privileged to work with them um, during this, during COVID-19. I've learned a ton from them. Um, they are just a, an expert group that's really going to, I think, offer a lot to all of our providers and our athletic trainers and everyone else joining us today. Uh, and, and, and some words of inspiration and encouragement to hang in there, because uh, we all know that this is super, uh, s super hard. And um, we hope that we'll offer some really good, um, you know, education today to all of you to, to apply to your patients. So um, just a few housekeeping items before we get started. Uh, we, uh, this is offering a CME and also a CEU to any athletic trainers and or providers in the audience. So uh, you will receive an email next week indicating how to uh, obtain your statement of credit. So just keep a lookout for that. Uh, and also keep in mind that you do uh, need to be on uh, for the full 60 minutes in attendance to receive that CME. Um, so without further ado, I'd like to kind of pass the baton here um, to our MC for the day, which is gonna be Dr. Josh Brashad. Dr. Brashad is our Executive uh, Vice President of Physician Services. He's also Chief Medical Officer of Rutgers Athletics and he is a clinical assistant professor in Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. So, Dr. Brashad, the show is yours. Thank you very much. Uh, and Diana, thank you for all of your efforts on behalf of the athletes across the state of New Jersey to keep playing during COVID. Um, good morning, everybody. I'm truly privileged to have um, my friends and colleagues um, of, of tremendous expertise um, on, this, on this call with us. I'm going to introduce our, our keynote speakers and then our panelists. Um, and, uh, and then I'll make a few brief remarks about the COVID and athletics, and then we'll jump right into the topic of sports cardiology. Uh, first, we have Dr. Jeffrey Lander. Uh, Dr. Lander is the co-director of sports cardiology at RWJ Barnabas Health. He's also a cardi the sports cardiologist for Seton Hall University Athletics. And um, he also is one of our cardiologists who is consulting on Rutgers Athletics uh, in managing the COVID pandemic. We also have Dr. Anthony Altabelli, Dr. Altabelli is the Chief of Cardiology at Robert Wood Johnson University Hospital, uh, and, and along with Dr. Lander, the other co-director of sports cardiology for RWJ Barnabas Health. And he's a consulting cardiologist, again, with Rutgers University Athletics, as well as Princeton University Athletics. So we're in great hands from a cardiology perspective in understanding uh, sports cardiology and its relationship to COVID-19. In addition, we're privileged to be joined uh, by Dr. Jason Womack. Dr. Jason Womack is the Chief of uh, Sports Medicine Family Medicine and Sports Medicine at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School and the head team physician um, at Rutgers Athletics. In addition, he serves uh, multiple high school school districts as a team physician. And finally, uh, last but not least, Dr. Jason Christofiak, who is a team physician at Rutgers Athletics, as well as the medical director of the Morahan Center um, and uh, for sports for sports medicine, um, and also an assistant professor at Rutgers Robert Wood Johnson Medical School. So again a group of people with tremendous expertise, knowledge, and who have been right in the middle, truly right in the middle of dealing with COVID and athletics during this time. Uh, a couple of brief remarks. I think for all of us uh, on, the, on the panel, we are involved in sports uh, on a daily basis, uh, both professionally, obviously given the roles that people serve in, 
And personally, I think all of us have kids and, and personally participate in athletic activities um, and have continued to do so during this during this pandemic. And if I had one message to, to pass along, it's been incredibly challenging for all of us professionally and personally um, to deal with the pandemic. Um, it's been incredibly challenging and disruptive for our sports community uh, during this pandemic. But nonetheless, in New Jersey, and at least at our athletic programs at the collegiate level that we're involved in, we've been successful. We're still playing. Um, we still have teams that have, uh, we were just talking about what our kids have been doing and where they've been playing and how we got through seasons and people went to championships and and there were celebrations and and uh, and uh, and sadness when we lost games. Um, that was an incredibly important uh, change from what's been going on in the world uh, with COVID. And, and the, and the underlying idea that we've noticed is that it's relatively safe to play sports. So again, it's relatively safe. We have not seen much transmission of COVID during athletic events. Um, it is all the things that are surrounding athletic events, celebrations and car rides and parties and gatherings and time in the locker room. Um, but athletics itself has not spread much COVID. I don't wanna say any, but it hasn't spread much COVID during during uh, athletic events. And so with the right precautions and the right safety checks, uh, we believe that it is safe to continue to participate in sports as long as we take the right precautions. And on an optimistic note, we all hope that this is coming to a, uh, toward the tail end of this pandemic uh, as vaccinations roll out. Uh, at, and at the moment, we just need to be safe and mask and socially distance and, and be especially careful as we go through the athletic time. So. Uh, I'm going to stop my remarks there, and I'm going to introduce Dr. Altabelli, who is going to start talking about sports cardiology, and we'll join back uh, later to answer some questions. So, Dr. Altabelli, why don't you take it away? So, hopefully, everyone can see my screen. Thanks, Diana, and thanks, Josh, and, and most of all, thanks for our participants this morning who are taking the time out of their uh, busy schedule to join us. So, uh, as Josh mentioned, I'm the clinical chief of cardiology at RWJ New Brunswick. Um, I'm an adult cardiologist, but I do have an interest in sports cardiology, and part of my professional time is spent advising programs, athletes, and their families about cardiovascular issues. Um, the first part of our talk today, I'm going to give just some general comments about sports cardiology, um, and then we're going to talk specifically more about the COVID-19 pandemic when I hand it over to Dr. Uh, Lander. Uh, here are my disclosures. They'll have no bearing on today's presentation. So again, as I mentioned, so my objectives, I, I just want to give you an, a broad overview of sports cardiology um, in, in terms of what, what is involved uh, in the field. And then I'll talk a little bit about specific sports cardiology health issues, um, some of the uh, issues that present to us as physicians and then I'm also going to take some time because I think it's a very important topic is pre participation screening, which is a big part of sports cardiology. And then finally, I'll have some comments on uh, myocarditis and then Dr. Lander uh, will discuss current guidelines and how to screen the COVID positive athlete prior to uh, returning to training and competition. So sports cardiology. Um, it's really an evolving field. Um, you know, we're caring for athletes, but not only athletes, uh, active individuals uh, who have known or previously undiagnosed cardiovascular conditions. Um, and our job really is to ensure the health and safety of the athlete during uh, athletic participation. And part of that uh, safety uh, evaluation is screening for all cardiac conditions, but especially those that predispose to sudden cardiac death, uh, which is a big topic in high schools, college, as well as professional sports. And although uh, sudden cardiac death receives significant attention and evokes a lot of emotion, really in part due to the fact that we equate athletes with health, uh, it is a big part of sports cardiology. So what is the global numbers of athletes when we talk about uh, athletics in the United States? Well, we know there's tens of millions of kids who are playing youth sports uh, in middle school. Um, there's approximately 8 million kids participating in high school sports, and that's based on the National Federation of State High School Associations who do an annual participation survey. Um, we also should note that there's a significant number playing the NCAA um, based on recent data, about 48,000 athletes 
And again, in the world of sports cardiology, as well as adult cardiology, it's important to make mention of the master's athletes. Um, these are the athletes who are above the age of 35. Um, and it's important because they may present with different cardiac issues than their younger counterparts. So how do we define an athlete versus the weekend warrior or the recreational athlete? Um, in sports cardiology, the athlete is one who's focused on training, competition, and achievement. So that really separates the weekend athlete um, versus the team athlete in high school and in the NCAAs. The sports cardiology team, it's a large team. It involves both medical and non-medical members that in one way or another support the athlete. It really starts with our, our pediatricians, our athletic trainers, and our sports medicine docs. Um, you know, we as sports cardiologists participate in screening, but we're also involved in evaluation and diagnosis. And when we do make a diagnosis, we often then rely on our subspecialists within the field of cardiology for arrhythmia, our electrophysiologists for cardiomyopathy, at times our heart failure uh, cardiomyopathy uh, physicians. And when we find a disease entity that may have a heritable cause, we then may rely on our congenital heart specialists and another big part of sports cardiology is the appropriate use of cardiac imaging, uh, particularly knowing that the pretest probability of disease in this population is low. So we wanna make sure that when we do cardiac testing, we put it in the right hands who really know how to interpret it. So the first part of sports cardiology health issues really is diagnosis. So um, athletes really come to me in three ways. Uh, they present with symptoms, and really the most common is exertional shortness of breath that's out of proportion to workload. And it really is important to ask the athlete when they're short of breath, is it early in exercise? Is it a peak exercise? It, is, it, is it in recovery? And again, get a sense of, is it out of proportion to the workload? Most athletes will tell you, I just don't feel I should be short of breath with this degree of activity and I am. So that's kind of the litmus test to get a sense of if, if this is a normal physiologic response to exercise or if there's an underlying problem. Other common symptoms are chest discomfort, near syncope, dizziness or lightheadedness, and that may occur during exertion or in the post-exertion recovery phase. And then finally palpitations. Uh, the second group of athletes that are referred to uh, myself would be those that have an abnormal physical exam, and the most common finding would be a heart murmur that needs to be investigated, and also the Marfan phenotype, um, you know, the tall, thin um, athlete, and you have to be careful there because if you're dealing with the volleyball athlete or the swimmer, um, sometimes uh, the idea that they may have Marfans just based on a phenotype may be incorrect but that means that they need to be carefully examined. Uh, and then finally, abnormal testing, uh, the most common of which would be an abnormal EKG. So what are we looking for? Really three classes of, of, of disease entities, structural abnormalities. I think the most common one for all of you that everyone's well aware of would be hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Uh, the second one would be electrical cardiac abnormalities, and I think there one of the most common is Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome, where the athlete has an accessory pathway that they conduct down. Now, that's kind of tricky, and that's where a pre-participation screening with an EKG can be helpful, because if an athlete reaches up to 180 to 200 beats per minute uh, heart rate at peak exercise, it may not be clear if this is a sinus tachycardia or they're conducting down their accessory pathway in Wolf-Parkinson-White syndrome. And I've made a couple diagnoses of WPW in athletes. And then finally, the acquired cardiac abnormalities and, and the focus of today is infection. So that would be myocarditis. So the second part of sports cardiology, as I mentioned, is the screening part. And you know, there's a lot of debate on how to screen, should you screen, uh, what makes a good screening program. And here I offer to you on this slide what I feel um, a good screening program should entail. Uh, we should identify a, an important health problem, which if we act on or intervene upon, can have significant benefit to the individual. It should be cost effective, 
Uh, there cannot be any undue cost. I remember giving a, a, a grand rounds to the Middlesex County athletic uh, directors uh, about 10 years ago. Um, and you never want to be in a position where some kids are screened and some kids are not because of finances. It should be easy to administer and have no undue burden on the athlete and their family. It should be consistent, reliable, and it should be valid, meaning we should be able to detect disease um, without overcalling disease. And then what are the screening methods? Um, the gold standards, the history and examination. Then the question is, do we add EKGs to all athletes? And then do we add imaging such as echocardiography? And I'll make a few comments about that. So what are the causes of death in young competitive athletes? Um, now, this study that was published a number of years ago looks at middle school, high school, college, and professional sports, and it was actually part of the 2007 update uh, on pre-participation screening for cardiac abnormalities in competitive athletes. Um, and this was uh, about 1,400 young competitive athletes, and it was part of the Minneapolis Heart Institute Foundation Registry. And as you can see, hypertrophic cardiomyopathy was the most common cause of death in young competitive athletes. Um, also keep in mind, I mentioned the masters athletes, which were also captured in this study. Um, because they're older, they're a different demographic. So they often participate in individual sports, such as long distance running. And because they're reaching middle age, atherosclerotic heart disease becomes more of a prevalent issue. But again, just to bring your attention, um, here we have myocarditis in 6% of the population that was deemed a cause of death. But let's whittle that down. What about the NCAA athlete? Um, and uh, this was published back about five years ago. And this was a 10-year database of NCAA deaths. Um, and the cause of death was adjudicated by an expert panel. And uh, when available, autopsies were, were the best way to adjudicate the cause of death. There was 514 student deaths in that in that 10 year database, half of which were due to accidents. Um, in the rest of the uh, deaths, the medical causes of death, there were 79 sudden cardiac deaths, and uh, 64 were deemed to have a primary cardiac cause. Um, it's worth noting if you look in the top right upper quadrant. The most common medical cause of death was sudden autopsy negative unexplained death. So even with autopsy, we may not know the reason why the athlete died. But again, bringing us back to uh, the pandemic, 9% of these deaths were due to myocarditis. So 9% sounds like a lot, but let's whittle that down. Um, how many was 9%? And as you can see by this graph, um, of the 79 sudden cardiac deaths, six were deemed to have a cardiovascular cause, and six out of the 64 were attributed to myocarditis. So again, small numbers, and I think that's what I would impress upon you, small numbers, but they exist. What's the incidence of sudden cardiac death? Uh, it's reported both in high school and in college at one in 50,000 per athlete year. But we also have to look at our athlete. We have to look at their gender, their race, and the sport that they play. Because sudden death, and this has been shown in multiple registries, is higher in men, higher in basketball players, and higher in black athletes. So for a black male basketball player, it's one in 3,000 athlete years. So if you're thinking about doing a screening program and it's limited into which athletes, you may wanna start with basketball and I would also say football because the incidence of sudden cardiac death in that population is higher. Well, let's give a different perspective. So if you're gonna have a screening program, you wanna have an incidence of something that's great enough that you would wanna detect it and whatever you're detecting, you would want to prevent it because it would have significant health implications. So you always have to ask yourself, does the incidence of what you're trying to detect justify the cost and time investment of a screening program? And does the detection of the condition allow us to prevent it and to prevent downstream health issues? So let's give uh, 
kind of another example that we're all familiar with, the TSA and screening. In 2019, 824 million passengers were screened, 824 million passengers. Well, let's look for one particular thing we're screening for, and that's going to be firearms that were discovered at TSA checkpoints in 2019. So of those 824 million passengers that were screened, they found 4,432 guns at the checkpoint and 87% of those guns were loaded. So that's not that many. However, if that's your flight and you don't know the intention of the person who has the gun, you're gonna be happy that it was screened. But again, you have to look at cost you have to look at the undue burden on the people being screened, and we all know that by going through the TSA checkpoints. But again, do we accept the cost and do we accept the hassle to make sure that we're not on one of those flights with somebody who has a loaded gun? And I would, I would just, you know, I look at it this way as practitioners and people who care about other people, we always may forget those you screened but you never forget the one that you saved. And I think that that's also part of the emotion of a screening program. How do we screen? Well, certainly history and physical, and it has to be done uh, rigorously. Um, and we have to make sure that we hit on all the points, and I'll mention that on the next slide. Then the question is, is the 12 lead EKG, should that be part of screening? I would submit to you it should be. And if there is an abnormality on the EKG, then we should increase our diagnostic abilities by looking at advanced cardiac imaging, starting with echocardiography, and then considering other advanced cardiac testing and imaging. And in the context of the world's pandemic, cardiac MRI of the athlete to rule out myocarditis is now a mainstream consideration. The gold standard um, should be the American Heart Association uh, and European Society of Cardiology recommendations. I know in the state of New Jersey, uh, the American uh, Academy of Family Medicine and the College of Sports Medicine have their own. Um, I've looked at both for the most part. They're very similar. There are seven points in the personal history, three points in the family history, and four points on the physical exam. The key here, however, is really making it self-explanatory. It's not very easy if you ask a family member if there's a history of hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. You may want to be interrogating them about sudden death, an unexplained death, things that were unexpected. So keep in mind the H&P remains the gold standard. Well, what about EKGs? The Bethesda criteria in 05 and the European Society of Cardiology in 05 published their, their recommendations on pre-participation screening of the athletes for cardiac disease. And EKGs were both part of the uh, recommendations. But that really has evolved over time. And if you look at the Bethesda criteria in 2015, the update, uh, looking at recommendations on how to screen for cardiovascular abnormalities, um, the Bethesda recommendations really no longer place an emphasis on EKG screening. Um, but the European Society of Cardiology and the International Olympic Committee still feel EKG should be part of pre-participation screening. And I'll submit to you my opinion is uh, for a $10 test, that's not cumbersome. It's easy to administer. I still think it should be part of screening. Does EKG screening as a tool work? The Italians will tell you that it does. In Italy, since 1982, they have a mandatory screening. Uh, they screened all athletes over a 25 year period. And as you can see from the, the dramatic drop in the top graph, they reported an 89% reduction in the annual incidence of sudden cardiac death in athletes using EKG as a screening tool. And this is often cited. However, the Israelis then published a study looking at the same. And as you can see, the drop in the pink line is the Italian uh, data. The yellow line is the Minneapolis data, which really didn't show an impact. And actually the Israeli Sports Authority, which instituted a screening program 
comparing 12 years after versus 12 years before instituting EKG screening showed little change in outcomes for sudden death. So why did the Italians find something that was different? Well, they compare 25 years of screening to two years before they screened. So maybe they didn't sample enough of a pre-screening time period, whereas the Israelis, Israelis did 12 years before and 12 years after. And it's also postulated that there's a higher incidence of arrhythmogenic right ventricular cardiomyopathy, which is a known cause of sudden cardiac death. So again, um, I would say screening's important. I want to know who has a loaded gun before they get on my flight. The AHA 14 point questionnaire is very helpful because it standardizes the history and physical and helps you not to miss anything. EKG screening, it has to be done or interpreted uh, by the correct individual. And currently the international criteria for EKG interpretation is the most uh, updated iteration of criteria that should be used. The false positive rates in high school and college athletes, as I write there, is less than one and a half percent. If there is an abnormality, or if there's two questionable abnormalities, we should move on to echocardiography. It's cost effective, it's available, and we have to remember that it has to be interpreted by the correct people because the interpreter must understand the physiologic adaptations to exercise. What do I see? I see thick LVs. It doesn't mean that they have hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. I see dilated right atria and dilated vena cava in athletes all the time. I think that that's, those are normal physiologic adaptations to exercise. But keep in mind, no algorithm is perfect. So I'm gonna close with some comments on myocarditis to bring us back to the, the pandemic. Uh, it's an inflammatory disease of the myocardium. Um, the diagnosis, uh, there are specific criteria based on histology and immunology. In general, I would just tell you, it's the disruption of the normal myocardial architecture that usually leads to aberrations in conduction, which can then lead to arrhythmogenesis. Uh, there's a variable clinical presentation. Some people have it and have no symptoms. Some people may have severe symptoms. It may be focal or it may be diffuse. But again, the diagnosis is a clinical diagnosis and the guidelines from 2003 European Society of Cardiology support that. We do blood tests, SED rate and CRP, and we do biomarkers, troponin, and then we can consider imaging with cardiac MRI. But I will tell you, this again is a clinical diagnosis and it really gets down to the history that the patient offers or the athlete. An endomyocardial biopsy is not a big part of it. Well, why is myocarditis important? Well, there's a list of viruses that have been shown to cause myocarditis, those that are common and less common. However, we have to now we have the coronaviruses. 2003 was SARS-CoV-2, 2012 was the MERS epidemic, the Middle East Respiratory Syndrome, and myocarditis was associated with those. And we're very well aware of SARS-CoV-2 also causing myocarditis. Recently, as recently as two weeks ago, there was a publication in the Journal of the American College of Cardiology. Um, they actually looked at 201 hearts, either through an endomyocardial biopsy or an autopsy. Um, and they only found myocarditis in nine out of 201, which is four and a half percent. So we know from registries and now we know from pathologic diagnosis, again, myocarditis is out there, but it's not out there maybe to the extent that we're concerned about. And my last slide, uh, the prognosis, most of the time it's asymptomatic and self-limited, um, but if it's acute, um, you know, we usually we get the patient through it. If they have symptomatic myocarditis, it can lead to heart failure and a dilated cardiomyopathy, and ultimately left ventricular dysfunction, heart failure, arrhythmias, and conduction disease. But again, I will tell you that the numbers are small. So I'm gonna turn it over to Jeff now and uh, he'll take you through the second part of the presentation. 
Uh, Dr. Altabelli, thank you. While you're while we're transitioning slides here and presenters, I just wanted to make an announcement to the audience. Um, if there are questions that you would like to ask our panel today, there is a Q and A section right on the bottom, uh, probably of your screen or or in the top uh, right corner. You feel free to type some questions in there, and we'll try to address as many as we can at the end. All right, Diana. Thank you, Dr. Altabelli. Thank you for that great overview of sports cardiology and a great segue into our next topic. Uh, I'll just start by saying I, I have nothing to, to disclose relative to this topic. And what we're going to talk about now is we're going to keep in line with COVID and sports, but we're really going to focus on our athletes who've tested positive for COVID-19 and how do we get them back to play uh, as efficiently and safely as possible. COVID-19 at this point, clearly it's, it's, it's a pandemic uh, and it's, it's, it's everywhere. It's throughout the country, um, east to west, north to south. Um, and it's certainly pervasive throughout sports. There have been some big name professional athletes who we've, we've all read about in the media who've had cardiac complications or cardiac issues associated with COVID-19. Um, but this, this clearly isn't limited just to professional athlete. We've all seen it at the university level, at the high school level, and we've all seen COVID-19 in athletes in our, in our private practices. So it, it's really pervasive. What we know um, about, in general, what we know about COVID-19 really started um, from what we've seen in our hospitalized patients. Generally, our hospitalized patients are, are sicker. Um, they generally have more comorbidities and they're an older population. And what we've seen in this generally sicker population and that up to about one quarter, so 25% of these hospitalized patients were noted to have myocardial injury. And that really started to set off some alarm bells, particularly in the, the sports world, because then we were extrapolating saying, hey, you know, we have these athletes who are testing positive for COVID-19. Is, is there a, a, a chance that 25% of these, these athletes are going to have some kind of cardiac involvement? So some, there was some concern, and, and rightly so. To really remember is, to these two populations, you know, can we really correlate one with the other? Because remember, these hospitalized patients, as we mentioned, they're older, they have comorbidities, they're generally sicker, as compared to most of our athletes who are younger, uh, healthier, and don't have all the associated comorbidity. And Dr. Altabelli uh, pointed out nicely the, you know, prior to COVID-19, the rate of myocarditis that we see is anywhere from six to 7%, all the way up to 20% or so, depending upon the paper, uh, accounted for about seven to 20% of sudden cardiac death in athletes. So rightly so, we, we need to assess the athlete for myocarditis, we need to make sure their heart is strong, make sure there's no evidence of any injury before we get them back to play. And the big question is, what will COVID-19 change this? Are we going to see those myocarditis numbers increasing? Um, and that's what we, a lot of these research papers, these research protocols have come into play. So far, what we know about myocardial injury and myocarditis in athletes has been limited to some relatively small observational studies. The good news is this is changing. Um, in the Big Ten, for example, there is a red tree looking at all of the athletes who've tested positive for COVID-19. There's a larger NCAA registry going on. Um, there's also professional registries. So we are actively looking to get more information and guide us in our recommendations. And as Dr. Altabelli mentioned, now, myocarditis is, is quite serious, something we do need to take seriously, can't, can't just be tossed aside. And one of the big things that we worry about in athletes in particular, the thinking is that if we are exercising during the acute phase of myocarditis, not only may it prolong the actual illness itself, but it can also be a trigger for arrhythmia. And these can be certainly dangerous arrhythmias, and this is often what we accounts for a lot of the sudden cardiac death that we see related to myocarditis. So it's important that we screen for myocarditis. Uh, easier said than done. It certainly can be difficult because the athlete 
secondary to their intense training can see normal remodeling in the heart. So what we call exercise induced remodeling. Sometimes it can be difficult to differentiate this remodeling from the pathologic remodeling that we see in myocarditis. So it's really important, I wanna stress this, that these athletes be evaluated in experienced centers, these centers that have a lot of athletes and that there's something that they see on a more or less daily basis. Everybody who's, who's on this webinar, uh, everyone on the panel, everyone watching, I'm sure we've all been doing a pre-participation evaluation for years. Um, we've all been doing the PPE when, when PPE was still the pre-participation evaluation and not, not doesn't stand for personal protective equipment. Um, so we're well familiar with what Dr. Altabelli uh, outlined, but this takes on new importance in the, the COVID-19 era. Now, we may need to fine tune our history and physical a little bit in the post-COVID athlete so that we really pick up on some of the subtleties that, that we wanna look for. Um, to help us do this, help us evaluate the post-COVID-19 athlete, our first recommendation from the American College of Cardiology came out back in May of 2020. And uh, this time it was still relatively early on in the pandemic. So a lot of the information was really just expert consensus. And rightly so, the recommendation started out pretty conservative as far as what we wanna do holding out the athlete, what we wanna do evaluating testing the athlete, because the thinking was it's better to be on the cautious side while we, there's still little that we know about this disease uh, before we let the athlete get back to play. As time progressed, unfortunately, we all saw uh, a lot more athletes who were testing positive for COVID-19 and the complications or lack of complications that followed. And as this new information came to light, the recommendations were revised more recently. This was just this past December, a new set of recommendations came out and which we'll go over shortly. These new recommendations, you know, we're a little less conservative than the first ones back in May. They still trend towards the more conservative side, because again, this, this is a totally new entity that we're dealing with and we're really learning as we go. Uh, and as we continue to learn more, I'm sure that these screening recommendations will continue to evolve um, and hopefully for the better. And my suspicion is they'll, they'll continue to trend less conservative um, and get more athletes back to play safely. So a great place, a common sense place to start when evaluating and screening the athlete is with one of the easiest things to do. And that's a focused medical history and an examination. There's some things that will stick out that, that will be obvious, chest pain, shortness of breath, passing out. Um, these of course are gonna trigger, trigger additional testing, but we really need to be careful to look beyond the, these typical symptoms. We want to delve a little bit deeper. We want to ask about exercise tolerance. Has there been any changes in their performance levels? Are they really, are they still able to get up to their normal baseline? Do they feel they're lagging behind their teammates or what they usually were doing? You really want to tease out some of these things that could be more subtle and more indicative of a cardiac involvement. And when we do see some of these red flags, it's probably going to prompt some additional testing. As we order this additional testing, it's really important to remember that there's always a balance between the sensitivity and specificity of our tests. So beyond the history and physical, as we start to add on additional testing, which may be things like an EKG, an echocardiogram, or more advanced imaging, such as a MRI, our sensitivity will certainly increase. Now, each test we add on so will pick up some more abnormalities that may be potentially abnormal. So we will have a higher sensitivity for picking up disease, potential disease in these athletes. However, the trade-off is a drop in specificity. So even though we were picking up more potential abnormals, the key word here is potential, because now we're gonna to start to see a lot higher incidence of false positives. We're gonna start seeing some things in the gray zone that are not quite normal, not quite abnormal. So the, the specificity will drop. Um, and this is important as we go over these testing modalities to keep this in the back of our minds that again, no test is perfect. And it's always, always a trade-off. Yes, we may pick up more potential abnormalities, but our specificity 
uh, will likely drop as a result. And one of the first tests that we often um, will add on after their history and physical is the ECG, the electrocardiogram. And it's really a, a very, it's, it's an effective tool in detecting conditions that are associated with sudden cardiac death. However, there's some, some pitfalls when it comes to the ECG and myocarditis. The findings on ECG in the setting of myocarditis are, are pretty varied. We may see PVCs, premature ventricular contractions, arrhythmias, a left bumper branch block, an AV nodal block, um, but they're very nonspecific. There's not one pathognomonic finding that we can cling to and say, yes, th this makes a diagnosis of myocarditis. Uh, it's the sensitivity for picking up myocarditis on ECGs is actually south of 50%. So clearly not what we want to see for, for an effective screening tool. You couple that with the fact that greater than 70% of athletes will have a repolarization abnormality or other changes linked to exercise-induced remodeling on the EKG. And this makes you know, picking out normal from abnormal a little bit harder. For example, let, let's look at these two ECGs on the screen that you see there. One of these ECGs is from um, someone who has, is in the active phase and is, was actually quite sick with myocarditis. The other ECG is from a completely healthy athlete. Now, if you handed me these two ECGs, I, I have a pretty tough time differentiating between the two, which is the sick athlete and which is, you know, which is the, the athlete who is completely healthy. Another test we'll often turn to after ECG, after the history physical, is troponin. Now, we all know that troponin is a biochemical marker of myocardial injury. Um, we may think, well, that's just pretty simple. It's black and white. If it's positive, it's positive. If it's negative, it's negative. Great. But it's a little bit trickier than that. For example, we do know that prolonged strenuous exercise can cause a troponin leak. Typically, the pattern we see here is a peak and then a resolution of troponin about 24 to 48 hours after exercise. So it's important to keep in mind that if we are going to add on troponin to our athlete, athletic testing, we have to do so at least 24 to 48 hours um, after exercise so that we don't throw off our results complicate our results. The other thing to remember is there is a lack of reference ranges for athletes. We know for the general population what's considered normal, what's considered abnormal, but we don't have that same, that same um, reference range for, for athletes. So does, does the normal population reference range carry over to the athletes? Maybe, um, but we certainly have to keep that in the back of our minds. And remember that what we may call normal values, which is anything under that 99th percentile for the test. So once we're above that 99th percentile for, for the test, we'll call that a positive troponin. But we still may see some elevations that are not quite at that 99th percentile, but not quite zero. And what, what do we do with those results? The, these kind of gray zone findings might not necessarily exclude some kind of subclinical myocardial injury. So again, troponin testing may seem black and white, but it's pretty far from that. The third test that we'll commonly add on after history and physical ECG and troponin is the echocardiogram. And there's good reason for that. It has pretty great diagnostic capabilities and there's widespread availability of the echocardiogram. Generally, it's pretty easy to get an echo. The flip side of that, however, is that it's, it's not an inexpensive test by any means. And while it is while widely available, the sheer number of athletes who are gonna require testing may limit the access. Particularly, we couple this large number of athletes on top of a healthcare system that's already strained in the midst of, of a pandemic, you know, it may be hard to get the testing in a timely manner. So yes, ECHO has great diagnostic capabilities, but our access, access may be a bit limited coupled with potential cost. So overall, you know, we have to look at the potential risks of screening our athletes. One thing that we touch upon is the cost. Remember, nothing, nothing is free. And the more tests that we add on, the higher the cost is gonna generate for these athletes. It may put a strain on our, our already resource limited and overburdened healthcare system that's in the midst of a treating a pandemic. And as we do more testing, 
we're going to start seeing more questionable abnormalities, what we call these gray zone cases, something that may not be quite normal, but isn't quite abnormal. Uh, and it's going to be important to differentiate the expected athletic cardiac remodeling from something that may be a mild um, pathologic finding. So again, this points to really evaluating these patients in athletic centers, centers where we train athletes all the time. In this gray, these gray zone athletes where we may see a little something it leads to what I call, or what we call the diagnostic creep. For example, you may start with an ECG. That ECG maybe may say, eh, something a little bit abnormal here, not quite right. And then we get an echocardiogram. On the echocardiogram, again, we say, yeah, it, it's kind of borderline. Let's, let's, do, uh, let's get a troponin. And then we're getting an MRI. And then we're doing a stress test. So testing begets testing. And it doesn't necessarily lead to the answers that, that we want to see. So we have to watch out for this diagnostic creep. And importantly, some of these unnecessary tests or borderline tests may lead to unnecessary exclusion from sports. Of course, we want to be careful with the truly positive athlete, the, the truly sick athlete who may have myocarditis, but we do want to be careful not to exclude athletes who don't necessarily need to be sitting out at the time. And it's also extremely important to remember that there's no one size fits all uh, from a screening standpoint. What may work for a professional sports team may not work in our high school athletics. What may work for a university program doesn't necessarily work at the club level or with our master's athletes. So when, when thinking about a screening program, an optimal screening algorithm will really take into consideration the specific risks of a population, local experts, and the available resources. I'm gonna shift gears a little bit and get more specific, get into the weeds about the most recent recommendations. So this is what was put out this past December that what we've been uh, alluding to. And on first glance, this looks like a ridiculous, ridiculously busy slide, arrows, boxes all over the place. I promise you we're gonna break it down, make it simple so that everyone watching is gonna be an expert in our post COVID-19 testing uh, and getting our athletes back to play safely. So we'll just quickly see here, uh, those top few boxes, the way that the guidelines break it down as they look at symptoms, going from asymptomatic to mild to moderate and severe, and what do we do with each category of athlete? So let, let's, let's break this busy slide down. Let's make it a little bit more simple. The most important thing um, in where we go down our algorithm tree is determining symptoms. So the first is asymptomatic. That's easy. The athlete to test positive COVID-19 has no symptoms. Great. Mild symptoms, these are things like loss of smell, loss of taste, a headache, some mild fatigue, a mild respiratory or GI symptoms. Unfortunately, most of our athletes will fall in our asymptomatic to mild symptoms. As we move to the moderate symptoms, these are things like a persistent fever, so a temperature greater than 100.4, persistent chills, myalgias, lethargy, shortness of breath and chest discomfort, and the other important thing to remember is symptoms that are lasting for greater than 10 days. We're going to throw that into the moderate category. And again, anyone who's over the age of 65 will consider that moderate symptoms and anyone who has underlying cardiovascular risk factors. So these are things like coronary artery disease, atrial fibrillation, hypertension, and even diabetes. This will automatically place us in the moderate symptom category. Severe symptoms are those, of course, the things that are more than moderate. Anyone who's passed out and anyone who's been hospitalized will automatically place you into that severe symptom category. So we go from asymptomatic, mild, moderate, severe. So now that we know how to classify the athlete and their symptoms, what do we do? Well, the asymptomatic athlete, that's pretty simple. No exercise for 10 days, and generally they should be good to go. We can get them back to a slow, graded return to play. The athlete with mild symptoms, again, this fortunately is pretty simple. We'll have no exercise for 10 days from symptom onset. So that's 10 days from the onset of, of symptoms. And then we have to have full resolution of symptoms. And generally, we can get these athletes back to play without any additional testing needed. As we start to get into the athlete who's had moderate 
it gets a little more complex. So remember that that 10 day rule is still here, but it's shifted a little bit. So now we're going to recommend no exercise for 10 days after symptom resolution. So before we were looking at symptom onset. Now we're saying no exercise for 10 days after symptom resolution. And these athletes were probably going to want evaluated by a medical professional. And here we'll start with some of the things we talked about. We'll, of course, do a history and physical. I'm going to like to go over an ECG, troponin, and an echocardiogram to get a little more information. The severe athlete or someone, or the severe, the athlete who's had severe symptoms or been hospitalized. Here, we're going to bump that 10 days out to two weeks. So no exercise for two weeks following symptom resolution. And of course, we're going to want these athletes evaluated by a medical professional. So again, this is totally a history and physical, ECG, echo, uh, and a troponin. And some of these, if this patient was hospitalized, some of these tests may have been done already. And if they were normal, there's certainly no need to repeat them. So what if we go through our history and physical and we get testing and all of our testing looks normal? Great, we should be able to get our athlete back uh, to playing. And I keep mentioning a slow graded return to play. The reason for that is twofold. Because remember, these athletes, they've, they've just been sick. They've had this viral infection, coupled with the fact that they have now been sitting out for a minimum of 10 to 14 days. So they may be a bit deconditioned. We don't want to just throw them back in there right at game speed. We want to slowly work them back up to that. So what if our additional testing, like our ECG or our troponin or the echocardiogram is abnormal? Most the next test we're going to look to is a cardiac MRI. The reason we go to cardiac MRI, it's one of the better tests we have to look for, look for any myocardial injury or myocardial edema. So if we do the cardiac MRI and it's positive, so we have signs of injury or edema, we're generally going to put this athlete into the, into the myocarditis guidelines. And this is important because once we're diagnosing myocarditis, and again, there's a very strong clinical component to this, um, and there certainly is a lot of gray zone. So we want to be careful before we make this designation. But if we do, if we do determine that the athlete has myocarditis, they're now sitting out a minimum of three months before we start to think about retesting and getting back to play. So if we do the cardiac MRI uh, and it looks good, no evidence for any injury or edema in the myocardium, we're probably going to want to do some additional testing just to make sure there's nothing underlying that we're missing. So two of the more common tests we may order here are an exercise stress test or some kind of rhythm monitoring. If those two tests look normal, then we'll most likely be able to get that athlete back to play. So just to sum up the guidelines, I hope I've made it simple for everybody. If the athlete's asymptomatic or has had only mild symptoms, usually we're not going to need any additional testing. However, if the athlete has had moderate to severe symptoms, these are the ones who are going to want to be evaluated by a medical professional. And generally, we're going to want additional testing on these athletes. Once we ensure that everything looks normal, our testing looks good, there's no evidence of myocarditis, we're going to work back to that slow graded return to play. It's important to remember through all this, COVID-19, this is a new disease. We've only been dealing with this for a little over a year now. We're still learning about it. We certainly don't have all the answers yet, um, but we're working to get there. The recommendations that we have so far started pretty conservative, as we mentioned. They still lean that way, um, but they're changing. And I think we'll probably see some more subtle change as more information comes out. It's particularly important to remember that no matter how good our screening program is, there's always going to be an athlete that we won't pick up. Nothing is 100% effective. So it's extremely important that we all have an emergency action plan in place because an untoward event sadly will happen. And the best thing here is to have this emergency action plan in place, not to have it, not to only have it in place, but it also needs to be rehearsed on either basis, just in case something happens, we all know what to do. We all know how to respond and give that athlete the best chance of, of surviving and recovery. So here I'm going to stop um, as we're going through the guidelines. I'm sure you're all experts now uh, on the return to play guidelines. I hope I've broken it down and made it, made it easy to remember. 
And I'm sure you're thinking, great, those are the guidelines, but but what have you seen? What, what has been your, your, your real world experience? So here through Rutgers, we're actually involved in the, the Big Ten research protocol. For So that means for all the athletes who've tested positive for COVID-19, uh, they're placed in the research protocol and they've had significant testing. They've all had EKGs, troponins, echocardiograms, and cardiac MRIs. Now, while I certainly don't recommend this for all athletes, the reason we've done this is, is, is to learn more. Um, that's why the, the research protocol is in place. We really want to learn um, what, what happens to the heart with COVID-19. Is it safe to get back to play? What do we need? What tests are necessary? What tests are unnecessary? And what I can tell you with our experience so far, we were around about 200 athletes or so who've gone through the protocol, and there has been a very low incidence of cardiac involvement, in particular, very low incidence of myocarditis, which I find reassuring. Uh, and I also think it points to the fact that uh, the guidelines are pretty much on par to date and that we don't need advanced imaging for everybody. Um, and it's really, it's, it's reassuring to see that. Um, as we learn more, as a lot of the, these research studies come out, we'll certainly have more to say about that and push the guidelines forward. With that, I will pause. I will turn it back over to Dr. Brashad and our panel. Thank you, Dr. Lander, Dr. Altabelli, for a great, um, great information and relaying, relaying some of the facts and figures and, and ideas and concepts. Uh, we have some questions here. I'm going to try and focus on the questions. We have about five minutes left here. I'm going to focus on the questions that I think are uh, most generalizable. So if you asked a specific question about a specific item, I'm, I apologize. We probably will not uh, answer the, the very specific focus question. So I think. Um, the first question, and we're going to try and focus on COVID-19 related activities, just because that was um, uh, the, one of the topics that people had indicated they were interested in. So here we go. So the first one, um, what is our recommendation on a general return to play program? Um, I think Dr. Lander just um, reported it out uh, generally how to approach the, the athlete with COVID-19 uh, recovery. Um, but let me just pose that to, uh, to Dr. Kristofiak and Dr. Womack. Um, Maybe uh, Dr. Womack, you want to start just in a, because you have a broad experience at the collegiate and the high school level about a general return to play program. You're right on the front lines, like many of our folks who are are asking questions um, and having to return high school athletes uh, to sports. Uh, so maybe I'll just ask you to comment. Great, thanks. Uh, so yeah, at our you know particularly at our our high schools, which is very different than what we've done collegiately. We have a lot more resources and, and sort of some some uh, recommendations that have been handed down from, from our conference, but for at the high school level where we don't have those resources, we've really been following um, sort of the pediatric American cardiology guidelines and, and kind of going by whether folks are symptomatic or not. So we do do a follow-up history on all athletes and part of those questions now every season are, have you had COVID-19? And if you have, have you been hospitalized or did you have fever? And if you did for how long? Anyone that's had fever for more than three days, uh, we are recommending that they get cardiac clearance. Anyone with symptoms below that and, and no cardiopulmonary symptoms, we are clearing and just we're keeping an eye on them. Um, uh, so, so that's sort of our general uh, return to play for, for our high school athletes. Great, thanks. Thanks, Jay, for answering that. Hopefully that was helpful. Um, another question that came through was, uh, which measures can a physician use to determine the, the severity level of disease as competitive athletes can be known to deny symptoms to return to play? Um, we've certainly never seen that in our experience about not, not accurate. Uh, I'm obviously kidding about that. Um, so uh, let me pose this to, uh, to Jay Kerstofiak, um, who also is involved in both high school and collegiate athletics. Um, what objective measures can a physician use to determine the severity of disease in evaluating uh, people returning to play? Sure, thank you, uh, Josh. So, <clears throat> um, we actually haven't had anyone who um, fell in the category for severe illness at, uh, at Rutgers Athletics during our, our time with COVID-19. But so we're really trying to differentiate between moderate symptoms and severe. So right off the bat, if you've been hospitalized or required a hospital evaluation or been hospitalized, that usually falls under the severe category. And then for moderate symptoms, it's things that are usually lasting for more than 10 days. Um, more persistent fevers, 
a waxing and waning of a lot of the symptoms that is really common. You can get a lot of symptoms up front. They can kind of wane down and then kind of um, and then kind of go back up. So really, if you're looking at someone who's having persistent shortness of breath, high fevers, um, pretty much and having actually objective findings <clears throat> on pulse ox, a low pulse ox, an elevated heart rate, um, things like that, um, it ends up sometimes becoming a quick clinical judgment call on discretion when you take someone from the moderate category and go to the severe category. Uh, but typically, we're, we're not going to list someone as severe unless you're either being hospitalized or requiring a significant amount of support to normalize some of their vital signs um, that you would typically see more in the mild to moderate range. Great, thanks, Jay. Uh, one one quick que question uh, that someone asked was, uh, when we talk about symptom resolution, does that include the loss of taste and smell? Um, we would say no to that um, taste and smell loss, um, both in our athletic population as well as the general population of patients that we we serve. Most of us also do non-COVID related clinical care. Uh, we do COVID related clinical care for non-athletes as well. And the loss of taste and smell persists up to several weeks. So we would not include resolution of, of loss of taste and smell um, as a recovery. Someone might have persistent loss of taste and smell and could resume athletic activity. Um, another, another great question that was posed was, given that, given that we don't know how many people actually did have COVID, there were tremendous amounts of asymptomatic COVID cases um, across the country, including in New Jersey and probably among our athletic populations. What, what happens going forward and should we be requiring cardiac screening for all athletes that go forward? Um, that's a real challenging question. Um, maybe Jay Womack, you want to take a shot at what, uh, that's why I posed it to you, of course. Um, what do you think it looks like in the fall? Yeah. I don't know what it'll look like, but. Yeah, I think, you know, I, I, this is such a hot topic when it comes to just cardiac screening in general, and then you throw COVID into it, and there's a lot of debate back and forth. But, you know, I, I think resources for every single collegiate and, I mean, I'm sorry, high school and in middle school athlete to get cardiac screening can be very challenging. Um, I did briefly see something in the, in the chat about a pediatrician saying, well, I don't have an EKG machine in my office. Does everyone need an EKG? Um, you know, I, I think we need to have a low threshold uh, for when we should refer for cardiac evaluation. Uh, I don't think that every single person does need to get screening and there's plenty of people that would disagree with me, but certainly anyone who had COVID that had severe symptoms, meaning they were hospitalized or again, fever for greater than 72 hours. Those are the folks that I am really think need some type of cardiac eval because that would indicate that they had some high level of viremia and that level of viremia could have created a, a myocarditis type of situation we don't wanna miss. So that's currently how we're employing it at our, our current high schools to try to balance the needs of screening and also resource availability. Great, thanks. Um, and just, I wanted to touch on one topic also, um, Jay, maybe we could just continue to answer. Obviously the pandemic has caused, and I think we, and again, maybe we are um, uh, underestimating, and I saw a comment that someone put through, underestimating the amount of COVID that comes through athletic competition. That's fair, we don't really know for sure. That's our belief that we don't see much of it through. Um, we've been, all of, we've done tremendous amounts of contact tracing. Because especially because of our role at Rutgers, where we've talked to people about how transmission occurred. I mean, hundreds of hours of contact tracing with our departments of health. So we've been really, really close to the, the process of COVID spread um, during this time. And, and I think the, and we have hundreds, unfortunately, of cardiac MRIs and other data. We've been, our belief is relatively conservative that we don't want to over test and that we want people to participate because we've also seen the damage that excluding people from sports at a time when that's one of the few lifelines that they have uh, for normalcy. Um, mental health issues are really challenging during this time and they've come up as, we, as, we've, as we've, I, we've been forced to isolate lots of people and quarantine them over time. So Jay, Jay Womack, maybe you just wanna comment again on um, your experience with the mental health side of this and that balance between trying to be so careful about spread of disease and, and unnecessary quarantine. Yeah, thanks. Yeah, it's it's a definitely a challenging thing, and I think it's something that we don't think about as much. I, I think we we say, okay, we have to quarantine people, and all right, you just don't do anything for for seven to fourteen days, and it creates a significant amount of anxiety, not only for the individual being quarantined, but for their families on so many levels. Um, in my experience, about was I exposed? Am I going to get sick? Am I going to get somebody else sick? Now I'm isolated from my social networks for the, ne the next two weeks. I, or what am I going to miss in school or in sports? And now I'm going to be set back. Um, so I, I think the, the decision to quarantine should not be taken lightly. 
Um, you know, and I think a lot of school districts, because they're trying to be safe, uh, they just say, okay, well, one person on the team is positive, so we'll quarantine the entire team for two weeks. And um, the the mental health effects of that can't be understated. So, you know, it, it's been a goal of mine to try to, you know, provide resources to folks that are stressed because of quarantine and also um, to try to make sure we're not unnecessarily quarantining people. Because again, in our experience, especially now a year into this about, we're not seeing significant spread throughout entire teams. So, so it, it might be a little bit premature to just quarantine an entire team uh, in a certain sport. And, and the, the mental health effects of that are, are can be pretty, pretty significant. And, uh, you know, even just for some of our other outbreaks teams, you know, there's a lot of guilt. There's feelings that maybe they did something wrong. There's so many layers to it um, that the decision to quarantine shouldn't be taken lightly and, and it should be, uh, you know, decided and scrutinized and, and make sure it's done in the right way. Um, and please identify, you know, health providers, mental health providers in your community that can be accessed and help these folks that are quarantined because, you know, this anxiety might go under the radar and could have lasting effects. Thanks, Jay, for that comprehensive answer. We've seen a number in all of our different levels of sports involvement of folks at the, you know, club, you know, the 10 to 14 year old club sport level um, in the community. Um, the impact for those folks who may not have organized sports at their at their school level has been tremendous when teams close down and some of the, some clubs are extraordinarily aggressive about about quarantining um, again you know and again we're basing my comments are based on our experience at, at, at Rutgers especially where we've been tracking daily testing daily cardiac <laughs> screening and um, and as well as uh, as well as doing all the contact tracing ourselves literally hundreds of contact thousands of contact points from a diagnostic testing perspective and and contact tracing perspective and what we see what we have seen and again some of you on this call may disagree and that's okay we're just putting out our our view and what we've what we've seen is that um spread we have had positive athletes on the field of play um that we found out right afterward and we've tested everybody because we've had the ability to do that to see what the spread has been like and we have not seen spread in outdoor sports um, during the during the sporting event because we've been able to test everybody. <laughs> doesn't mean it doesn't happen, but we have clearly seen spread on bus rides, in locker rooms, uh, in team meals, and other social events. And so um, that's why we said we encourage to continue um, as best as we can. Obviously, being indoors is more challenging, um, but we we're, we are pushing ahead and recommending that we try again. There are teams when there are times when teams have to be uh, shut down and quarantine has to be utilized. But like Jay said, we're we're really um, concerned about the mental health aspects of of COVID nineteen as well. So I'm going to pause there and uh, turn this over to Dr. Jason Christofiak, medical director of the Moran Center, that's sponsoring the grand rounds for some closing remarks. Thank you all for being on here, and wish your you and your families uh, great health and great safety. Take care, Jay. Great, thank you, Josh. Um, you know, thank you to all of our participants today for joining us. Uh, you know, thank you for Dr. Aldebelli, Dr. Lander, Dr. Wilmack. Uh, Dr. Sharford for, um, for for being here as well. Um, as the medical director of the Moran Center, I'm proud to say that we have actually done over 38,000 cardiac and concussion screenings. Um, that's a great amount of number. I was picked up on a lot of baseline clinical findings that has led to further evaluations and make sure people are are safe to be able to continue their participation in athletics. Um, we're like we're going to continue our ground round series uh, again, sponsored by the Moran Center and uh, St. Barnabas Medical Center. Our next grand rounds will actually be in May of 2021. It's going to be a concussion based ground round. Uh, we hope to see a lot of you there. We understand that a lot of questions did come through and may not have been answered because of the restrictions and time. Please reach out. Um, you can send your questions to us and we'll do our best to make sure it goes to the appropriate individual that was on today's presentation to get answered. Um, we always encourage feedback and uh, again, with the pandemic, everyone stay safe and stay well and uh, go Rutgers. Thank you, Jay and Diana back to you to close out. Take care everybody. Bye everyone. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you in May. Take care.